All right, I want to, uh, as you know, I'm going to go ahead and, and quickly review a bit, and then we'll pick back up where we left off. Uh, we're coming near the end of the major section, the central section of the book of Hebrews, which is from 414 through 1025. We're getting toward the end of that, and that section, of course, it's an exposition on the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, and the focus of chapter 9, verse 1, through chapter 10, verse 18, is on the superiority of the new covenant offering. He talked about the superiority of the new covenant. Now, in that section, 9, 1 to 10, 18, he's really emphasizing the superiority of the new covenant offering, the superiority of Christ's sacrifice. He says in chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, there he discusses the pattern of old covenant worship. And in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 9, he introduces the superiority of Christ's offering for sin, explaining that he, he entered once for all time into the true holy of holies, into the very presence of God himself in heaven by his own blood, by his sacrificial death on the cross. And then chapter 9, verses 13 through 22, they speak of the superiority of Christ's blood. He says, in, uh, he says that his blood, his atoning sacrifice, that purifies even our consciences from sin, that we might serve God in a greater state of intimacy. And that sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ, which instituted or inaugurated the new covenant, is the basis of the eternal inheritance promised by God, because without that sacrifice, there would be no divine forgiveness, past or present. Without his sacrifice, there would be no divine forgiveness, and without divine forgiveness, there'd be no eternity with God. And the bottom line of that 9, 13 through 22 is in verse 22 where he, he says, look, the purifying effect of sacrificial blood is all over the Old Testament. Okay, it's all over the Old Testament and it's central to divine forgiveness. Then given the purifying effect of sacrificial blood, he says in 9, 23 and 24 that the heavenly sanctuary needed to be purified with a better sacrifice than the sacrifice of of animals. It needed something superior, and that's the sacrifice Christ provided. Okay, he entered into heaven itself to appear before God on our behalf. And remember the, the bigger context. He's writing to people who are in danger of turning back from Christianity, going back to some form of Judaism. And so the theme that he constantly sounds is the superiority of Christ. When you turn from Christ, you go from the greatest to something that is less. And that applies, as I've said, whether it's turning from Christ to go back to some form of Judaism, or whether it's turning from Christ to go back to the world, which seems to be the greater pull in our culture, to go back to you know, some kind of party, or you know, this thing where, where our culture says true life exists here. True life exists in wine, women, and song. And so there is a tremendous temptation to go back to that. And we have to sound this note of the superiority of Christ, who he is, what he is doing, what he has done. And so that's the bigger picture and the bigger context of what he's, what he's talking about. Then he says in 9, 25 through 20, 28, that unlike the earthly ritual of the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would go in every year into the Holy of Holies with the blood of animals, Christ appeared at one time in history. Okay, he appears at one time in history to provide forgiveness for all sinners through his, the sacrifice of himself. He says, look, like other people, Christ died once. But unlike other people who after death face judgment, Christ after his death, he returns to bring salvation. Okay, then he says in, in chapter 10 verses 1 through 4 that the law's sacrificial system, this was only a shadow of of the substance, a shadow of the true, effective, efficacious sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ. You know, shadows, they're not, you know, they represent things. They're not the reality, the substance. The substance is the sacrifice of Christ. And he says these sacrifices, they were all, in the old covenant, the law sacrificial system, that they were only a shadow of the substance. It's impossible for the blood of animals to be the actual basis for divine forgiveness because those sacrifices, they lack atoning efficacy. 
They lack atoning effectiveness. They are incapable of atoning for sin. So it's impossible for the blood of animals to do that. If they did, if they were able to atone for sin, they wouldn't need to be repeated every year. Once would be enough to get the job done as it was in the case of Christ's sacrifice. The substance, that's his assumption. As I said last week, he doesn't prove that. The assumption is is that the substance, the reality, doesn't need to be repeated. And so he says, look, in 10, 1 through 4, that the sacrificial system, it's a shadow. Then in 10, 5 through 10, he says that though God, through the law, he prescribed the offerings for sin, of course he did. They're part of the law that God gave. Though he did that, those offerings, they were never the fulfillment of his purpose. See, they were never what he desired in a final, ultimate sense. Yes, he prescribed them. But they weren't the end game, the final thing, the ultimate thing that he was after. Rather, his ultimate intention was the complete and perfect forgiveness provided through Christ's obedient offering of his body and sacrifice. That's where he was going. Okay, yes, he prescribed those things, but they were never his ultimate final intention. Okay, in accomplishing his ultimate purpose in Christ... The writer says that God supplanted the old covenant sacrificial system with the true sacrifice of Christ. Then in the last section, what we finished up looking at last week in in 10, 11 through 14, Christ's priestly activity is contrasted with the priestly activity of the Levites. Okay, and he says, look, that, that unlike the old covenant priest, whose ministry, it has a perpetually unfinished character to it. Unlike those priests who stand day after day and repeatedly offer shadow sacrifices that lack efficacy. Unlike those folks, Jesus Christ, he he offered himself once for all time the supremely efficacious sacrifice for sin once for all time and sat down. Sat down at the right hand of God. And he says that Jesus will remain in the heavenly realm until his second coming, his return which is mentioned, referred to in chapter 9, verse 28, at which time the kingdom he inaugurated at his first coming will be consummated. That's what we were talking just when we ended last time. See, the kingdom is a present reality. It has been inaugurated, but we live in this overlap of ages where it is not the sole reality. It is growing along and existing along with the old order in the old age. That's why we still have death, mourning, crying, pain, and all those things. But a time is coming. See, when the kingdom he inaugurated will be consummated, when he returns, all that is contrary to the eternal purpose of God will be stripped out. Or as the Hebrew writer will say, will be shaken out. You see, and what will exist then is the divine utopia, so to speak. The perfect reality in which there is no suffering, mourning, crying, or pain, which we will share in that, okay, uh, in the resurrection and we'll participate in it. Okay, let's pick back up now in chapter 10. Verses 15 through 18. Okay, 10, 15 to 18. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us after saying, this is the covenant which I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will not remember their sins and lawless deeds any longer. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer an offering for sin. He returns here to Jeremiah. Chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. And he asserts that, you know, what he's argued is in precise accord with what the inspired writer of the Spirit had said uh, long before through the prophet Jeremiah. What he's saying is consistent with that. God promised to make a new covenant after the making of the Mosaic covenant. And as I said when commenting on chapter 8, verse 10, I think the statement that God's laws will be written on the hearts and minds of the members of, the, of all the members of the New Covenant. I think he's referring there to the fact that all the members of the New Covenant will have the indwelling Spirit. All Christians have the indwelling Spirit, and by virtue of His transforming work in our lives, we have a greater desire and ability to obey the will of God. See, we will be more internally motivated and empowered to live godly lives than were those under the old covenant, generally speaking. I think that's what he's talking about there. But the effect of verse 17, when he says, then he adds, I will not remember their sins any longer and their lawless deeds any longer. The effect of that is is to connect the new covenant that was prophesied by Jeremiah 
with the experience of the new level of forgiveness, this fuller, perfect forgiveness that's provided by the sacrifice of Christ. You see, the shadows provided forgiveness, as I said, on credit, so to speak. But now that the reality has appeared, there is something deeper, something fuller about the forgiveness. It is a forgiveness that is able to cleanse even our consciences. Okay, which is a barrier to intimacy with God, a defiled or impure, bad, evil conscience keeps us with this sense of, I just really can't get close with God and be tight with him. But Christ's coming is superior because now that he's appeared in history, his sacrifice is able to cleanse even our consciences. So he's talking, I think, about this, this new level of forgiveness, this perfect forgiveness provided by Christ's atoning death. And he says, where a sacrifice has been provided that achieves full and perfect forgiveness. He doesn't spell that out, but I think that's what he's talking about. See, there's no need for any further sacrifice once that kind of sacrifice has appeared. Because once that kind of sacrifice has been made, everything else is rendered obsolete and superfluous. What else is needed when you've had the perfect, complete, full sacrifice of Jesus Christ? So that's what I think that he's saying there. Now, 10, 19 to 25, this ends this, this major section of the book that began at 414 through 16. Okay, and you see there are, there are a lot of verbal parallels in 10, 19 to 25 and 4, 14 through 16. That is the indication, see, that that marks off. They're like bookends of a section. Okay, so you have these verbal parallels that say, okay, here has been this section, this theme, which has been an exposition on the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. Now, within that section, there have been these interjections of exhortation. But he's been on this theme, this is a section, and these things mark it out by the verbal parallels. Let me read to you what uh, Guthrie says. He says, an inclusio, an inclusio is a literary device by which an author marks the beginning and ending of a section by verbal parallels. And that's what you see in 19 to 25, 4, 14 to 16. So that's, that's how you get to this idea of this is the section that he's going, the book ends, the beginning and the ending of this section. Verses 19 through 25, they also serve as a transition to the fourth and final section of interjection of exhortation, okay, which is going to be lengthy from 1026 down through 1319. So they both close out that section and they introduce the final interjection of exhortation. Okay, he says in, in 19 to 22, he says, Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence for entering the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way which he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, the hearts having been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and the body having been washed with pure water." The writer, in these verses, he exhorts his hearers, and I say hearers because you remember this is basically a written sermon, but he exhorts his hearers to approach or draw near to God. That is what he's telling them, he's urging them, he's exhorting them, that is what he's urging us to do, to draw near to God. Okay, that's the exhortation, and he bases the exhortation, the basis is, you see, he says, therefore, brothers, since... We have confidence. Since we have a a great priest, he bases the exhortation to draw near to God on the fact that they as Christians have confidence for entering God's presence because of Christ's sacrifice. And he bases the exhortation to draw near because we have a great high priest over the house of God. We have confidence because of Christ's sacrifice and we have a great high priest over the house of God. Now the fact Christ died as the true and fully efficacious sacrifice for sins, and that he serves as the great high priest in the immediate presence of God. That's what he's been talking about. He is in the immediate presence of God in heaven itself, in the Holy of Holies. The fact that he died for us as the perfect sacrifice, the fact he presently is ministering on our behalf, 
in the Holy of Holies in heaven provides all the confidence we need to heed the exhortation to draw near to God, to relate to Him, especially in worship, including prayer, with a new level of intimacy. I hope the word intimacy connects with you. Closeness. You see, there is this thing about, you know, you have husbands and wives have an intimate relationship. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about a normal, healthy marriage, okay? I understand that you can have marriages where, you know, I'm aware of that. I live here. Uh, but I'm talking about a normal, healthy relationship where there is no, there is no closer relationship. And we refer to that as intimate. It is close. We know one another and are close to one another. And there's just this bond. So that's what I'm trying to get at with this idea of intimacy, that we are to draw near to God. You see, without some sense of barrier, without some sense of, oh, just right there. That is why he's urging them and telling them to do that. And they are to do it on the basis that, listen, Christ is our perfect atoning sacrifice. And he is ministering on our behalf in the true holy of holies in heaven. So we have every basis to heed this exhortation that we draw near to God, that we do so with a new level of intimacy. Christ opened for mankind an unprecedented access to God's presence, a way through the curtain of the Holy of Holies. See, right through the curtain, right into his very presence, and he did so by his blood, by means of his flesh or body offered in sacrifice. This is a living way, Because Jesus, who is the way, is living. You see, this is, that's why this is a living way, because Jesus, who is the way, He is the way. He is everything. He is the one and He is living. Now, the manner in which we're exhorted to draw near to God, okay, to come to God in experience of this intimacy that we have that is possible for us, because of the sacrifice of Christ, because we have this great high priest, the manner in which we're exhorted to draw near is with a true heart and in full assurance of faith. See, we come with a new heart that is produced by God's Spirit, a heart that wants the things of God. Not a heart that's rebelling. Not a heart that's sitting here going, oh, you know what, you know, oh, I'm, my heart's over here, I'm longing for this stuff. A new heart where we are saying, listen, that wants the things of God, you know, as the deer pants for the water. See, that wants the things of God. Okay, so we come with a true heart and with a full assurance of faith. We have this new heart produced by God's Spirit, and we also come with a deep conviction about the truth of heavenly realities and the certainty of God's promises. Okay, this is how we're exhorted to draw near. We're exhorted to do it in this manner with a true heart and in full assurance of faith. You see, we have this deep conviction about the truth of heavenly realities. The world tells us all the time, this is nonsense, this is a fairy tale, this is pre-scientific, you know, you really got to be a bonehead to think this is true. And we come and say, I'm certain it's true. We come with full assurance of the truth that God is, He exists, His Son died, and His Son is ministering in His very presence. We come with that, with the full assurance of faith. And we come with full assurance that God's promises are certain. His promises are certain. We don't sit here and say, well, you know, I don't know, God's a, you know, He's a cosmic prankster. You know, He says these things and all that, and it's not, no, that's not. See, so we come here with a, with a pure heart or a true heart and with a, with a full assurance of faith. Now, the exhortation to draw near, it assumes, it assumes that certain conditions have been met. This is just presupposed in what he says. Okay, and you see this here. He says, let us approach 22 with a, with a true heart and full assurance of faith. The heart's having been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and the body having been washed with pure water. See, it it assumes that conditions have been met, namely that the hearer's hearts have been sprinkled clean from a bad conscience and that their bodies have been washed in pure water. See, to draw near to God, 
One must have one's heart purified from guilt by the sprinkling of Christ's blood. You see, remember when the the high priest, he goes in, what's he do? He sprinkles on the ark and in front of the ark, the blood. Well, to draw near to God, one has to have one's heart purified from guilt. Okay, purified from guilt by the sprinkling of Christ's blood, by the personal appropriation of the all-sufficient, fully efficacious sacrifice of Christ. We have to have that. See, he purifies even our consciences. He purifies even our consciences so as to remove this last barrier of intimacy with God. That's gone. Fully clean. You know how, you know, I hope you know what I'm talking about. How residual senses of guilt inhibit a relationship. You could see it in a marriage where there's some sense of lingering guilt about what one of the spouses had done. You see how that's a barrier. You see that all the time. Well, he's saying that Christ's sacrifice cleanses even that so as to remove that last barrier to intimacy, closeness, nearness, tightness with God. This is to be the experience of the redeemed. Okay, this is to be the experience, and we have to let people hear this, of how effective the cleansing of Christ is. Then he says, see, to draw near to God, one also must have had one's body washed in pure water in the rite of baptism. Okay, this is what he's talking about. Now, I know you can find a few people who will say, no, no, that doesn't have anything to do with that. Frankly, I think that's crazy. You know, writing in the first century, what else do you think? And I'm not alone in thinking that, okay? This guy, Paul Ellingworth, who is a a commentator, a highbrow type guy, he he wrote a commentary in 1993 in the New International Greek Testament Commentary Series. Okay, now he says there, he says that almost all commentators see here a reference to baptism. So this isn't, a, this isn't an odd view. This isn't a novel view. This isn't something, of, well, you know, you Church of Christ people, you just see baptism everywhere. Okay, well, no, this, this is a, a contextual, proper understanding. Let me read to you just a couple, of, give you a couple examples of this. Here's William Lane. He wrote a two-volume commentary, a highly acclaimed two-volume commentary in the Word Biblical Commentary series. He says the reference in 22b is almost certainly to Christian baptism, which replaces all previous cleansing rites. Christian baptism belongs to the new covenant because it is accompanied by the reality it symbolizes. Both clauses of verse 22b provide complementary interpretations of the event of baptism. The washing of the body with water and the purging of the heart are complementary aspects of Christian conversion. You see, this is where the spiritual transaction takes place. Is it because I think there's magic in the water? Of course not. It is because it is God's ordained way of calling out for the blessing. And so, he, you know, he, he, the writer of Hebrews, this is something that he assumes as a condition of the drawing near. Here's what uh, James D.G. Dunn says. Dunn is an internationally known New Testament scholar. He wrote this a, a few decades ago in his book, Baptism in the Holy Spirit. He says, the close complementary nature of the two cleansings, I don't know why there's a hyphen there, but uh, anyway, that's a, something from uh, formatting or something. Anyway, the two cleansings of heart and body referred to in Hebrews 10.22 remind us that we cannot separate Christian baptism, another one here, from conversion. Uh, It is related to the cleansing of the heart as the body is related to the heart. It is the outward embodiment of the spiritual transformation which is taking place inside a man. It would simply not occur to the writer or to early Christians generally that the two could be separate. The popular idea that conversion precedes baptism and that baptism is a confession of a commitment made sometime previously is not to be found in the New Testament. Baptism is the act of faith. Part of the total cleansing which enables the convert to draw near and to enter the Holy of Holies by the way opened up for him by Jesus. 
Now, see, this writer, the Hebrew writer, simply assumes that. Because all the people in the first century, that was part of the deal. That was the message. When you came to faith, you were baptized into Christ. So he simply, he says here, you know, this is a condition of drawing near, that they've had their hearts sprinkled clean from a bad conscience, and that they've had their bodies washed with pure water and the rite of baptism. Uh, you know, I, I could give you many other uh, leading commentators, the leading commentators in the English language, like Harold Attridge, who wrote the commentary on Hermeneia. He says the writer is no doubt alluding to baptism, uh, to baptism where the effects of Christ's death and exaltation were regularly understood to be appropriated by the believer. Victor Fitzner writes in the Abington New Testament commentary, he says the language of, cult, of cultic washing almost certainly refers to baptism. F.F. F. Bruce, New International Commentary on New Testament series, he says what he has in mind is surely Christian baptism. I could read to you James Thompson, Neil Lightfoot, Leon Morris, Donald Hagner. All of them don't have a problem seeing this. Where the problem comes is when I already have some theology that says there is a conflict between having baptism play any role in conversion and then I can't have it mean that. And so I now and I sit there and I say, okay, well, that can't mean this and that can't mean that. It just seems, you know, when I say it's as plain as the nose on my face, we're saying something. Okay? So that, that's, this is something that it, it, is, it is not an eccentric view. I say that because I, it, in my life it seems to me that people in churches of Christ sometimes get the idea that we have some kind of odd you know, non-historical, strange view. None of the traditional views of churches of Christ fall in that category. None of them. We stand in a huge stream of Christian history. Okay, but that's another subject to get off on. He says, 1023, Let us hold firmly the confession of the hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. See, he's encouraging his hearers to hold firmly to their confession of the Christian faith, the confession of hope, without wavering under the pressures they're facing. You remember, these guys are getting, having a tough time. Probably they're, the Jewish community uh, you know, from which they had come was turning their backs, shunning them, denying them jobs and all this kind of... That was a, a real hardship in that society. And then you have this looming persecution, which had happened some years ago when they, when they had booted out uh, the Jewish Christians, but you, ha you have here, you know, this looming persecution on the eve of Nero's, if, if the reconstruction I've given you is right, uh, you know, that's coming on the horizon. So there's this pressure. There's this pressure, and he sits here and he tells him, he says, hold firmly the confession of hope without wavering. We have pressures today. Our young folks, it's not just young people, but listen, we live in a world that is just completely worldly. I mean, that's all it's saying to you, nonstop. And so people, you know, they're simply being pressured in different ways. And they need to be urged and exhorted and told, hold to your confession without wavering. Yes, I know it's difficult. Yes, I know everybody and his mother saying this is where life really is and it's really cool. But you're not like everybody. You made a confession. You stood and said, before the world and God that Jesus is Lord. And you need to hold to that through all these things that are tempting you and pulling you. God is faithful. Do that. He says, for God, for he who promised is faithful. God is faithful in all things. See, so those who remain steadfast in their allegiance to Christ, who hold firmly their confession without wavering, can be certain that they will receive all that's been promised. That's why I say he's not a cosmic prankster. It's not going to be a day where you say, okay, listen, I was faithful to God, but what do you know? At the end, it turns out he either is deceitful or he lacks the power to deliver or any. That's not going to happen. See, and that's part of drawing near in the full assurance of faith. You draw near in the conviction, the certainty that what God says, his promises, he's going to do them. And he's got some great promises in store. So when you sit here and look, at, and the appeal is hold to that confession. When everything's pulling you this way, you just look at those promises and you compare them to the shabby lot that resides over here. All of these trinkets that are supposed to be, well, this is really life over here. Run out and, you know, party, cheat on your wife. 
Everybody dies. Come on, that's, that's where real life is. That's where meaning is. Okay, no. This is all just junk. Just junk that has been polished up to lure you. Buffed up. Made to look like something that shimmers. Over here. And the faith, you know, the, the real life is in Christ and we need to hold to that. We need to tell one another, hold to that. Because he who promised is faithful. He's going to deliver. Then he says in 24 and 25, okay, he just says, let us hold firmly the confession of the hope without waving, for he who promises faithful, and, and let us consider one another. Now, a lot of translations are a bit loose here. I wouldn't say that they're wrong. They're more interpretive. Okay, you have some that follow this kind of idea, but you have some that say, let us consider how we may. But the object of the consideration is one another. And I think it makes a difference in how you read it. He says, let us consider one another for stimulation of love and good works, not neglecting our own assembly, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now the writer here, he urges his hearers, when he says, let us consider one another, he's urging his hearers to pay attention to, to observe, to be aware of, to be cognizant of one another, with an eye towards strengthening the fellowship. That's what I'm convinced he's talking about. He says, hold firmly the confession of the faith, without hope, without wavering, for he who promised, and let us consider one another. Let us be aware of one another, a mindful of each other, with an eye towards strengthening the fellowship by stimulating love and good deeds within the community. By stimulating those things within the community by maintaining or deepening what already existed as we see in chapter 6, verse 10. Love and good deeds, acts of kindness, stimulating those within the community, this will strengthen the bond of fellowship. This will strengthen the ties of individuals to the community. And the bond of fellowship, see, it works in opposition to the forces that seek to pull one from the faith. That's a fellowship is like spiritual gravity. It's holding you to the confession. It works in opposition to all of these things that are saying to you, come over here, come over here. The idea that is loose in our culture that says, no, 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 look, look, I'm too spiritual for church. I'm too spiritual for, no, you know, God and I, we have this personal thing, you see. That's really spiritual. You know, I like to go sit out under a tree and kind of meditate. I'm really deep. I'm really spiritual. God says that spirituality, you see, is expressed in a community of faith. Christianity is a team sport. You see, we are a body, a fellowship. And it is very important that we stimulate love and good works because what that does, it draws the bonds, it strengthens the bonds and fellowship acts in opposition to those forces that are pulling one away from the confession. And this is serious business, you see. On the other hand, neglecting the congregation's gatherings, blowing them off, turning away and not going to them. You see, doing that, that works in conjunction with the forces that pull one from the faith. It does that. You say, well, how does it work in conjunction with the forces that are working against the confession, trying to pull you away? It does it because it's inherently discouraging to those who are gathered. It is inherently discouraging to those who are gathered, and it prevents the absent member from giving and receiving encouragement in that form. I mean, we understand the inherently discouraging aspect. We understand that perfectly well in the context of the military. Okay, we don't have a problem with that idea. Desertion crushes the morale of the troops. That's why enemies always try to incite it. What do we do when we're getting ready for the Gulf War? Something? We're dropping leaflets, telling people to come on over. You don't have a chance. Come on. Why do we want to do that? Because it crushes the morale of the enemy. We understand that perfectly well in that context. It crushes the morale of the enemy, and that's why armies punish it so severely. Why are they being so mean? They're being so mean because desertion is serious business. We understand that desertion crushes morale, and we're in a war, and people are being pulled, 
And we need to be sucking them in. Because they need the body of Christ, the community, to strengthen. Let me read you what a couple of uh, fellows say. There's David De Silva has a commentary on Hebrews. He says, withdrawing from the community does not merely mean that the individual falls short of God's gift. Withdrawing discourages those who remain and diminishes the group as a whole. To paraphrase John Donne's well-known apothem, each member's defection diminishes me and my determination to hold on to the costly hope. When one's fellow believers, one's fellow believers begin to defect, it makes one wonder about the value of the enterprise and the wisdom of remaining faithful. The other believers enjoyed the same advantages and knew the same God through the same mediator. Now they decide that society's acceptance is worth more after all. On what basis should I persevere when our common experience was not sufficient to make them regard perseverance as the advantageous or self-evident cause of action? Now isn't that just perfectly common sense? Isn't that right? So people who say, you know, listen, when you choose to walk away from the body of Christ or to ignore, you know, I think I'll bop in every now and then. I don't really want to be a part of the community of faith. No, you know, that's just not for me. You are harming the cause of Christ beyond yourself personally. Okay? Let that sink in because I'm telling you the truth. You are harming the cause of, cause of Christ more than you know. You are discouraging the people who are seeking to hold to their confession. You have gone over as a deserter and you are harming their morale, if I can put it in terms of military. It's serious business. Okay, it is serious. It's not, well, you know, what do I care? Uh, you know, I don't care. It's just, you know, me, I bop in, I do this. I don't know how to say this any harder than I'm saying it. Okay, because it is important. I've got another fellow here, Craig Coaster. He says, the call to show love calls for resistance to tendencies to abandon the Christian assembly in the face of reproach from outsiders. Coaster wrote a commentary in the Anchor Bible Commentary on Hebrews. He says, few people can maintain their beliefs, values, and hopes without social reinforcement, for their ties are mutual. Social bonds reinforce belief just as expressions of belief strengthen social bonds. Both personal commitment and community support are needed for people to maintain their convictions and manner of life within a larger society that does not share their views. We live in a culture. I hate to look. Our culture is rabidly opposed to Christianity. I, I, it, 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 do I have to say that? It is hostile to Christianity. It barely can tolerate it. Barely. And people who really believe it, that's considered grounds for, well, you know, you ought to be what? You ought to be put somewhere. You're either, you know, you're a superstitious moron, and you're dangerous. Now, that's how far we've come. Now, if you disagree with my assessment, you know, okay, I'm telling you, this looks obvious to me. But we live in that society, and as we float in that society, the idea that we can just sit here and bobble and say, well, you know, it's just me and God, okay? May it be so, but the reality is we need each other. We need one another. That's why we care. In fact, what do they do? They say, listen, when somebody is converted, they have to be brought into the community of faith. Why do they care about that? They care about it because they understand that we are a community and that strength, as I say, fellowship works in opposition to the forces that pull one from the confession. And so we need that, and we need to encourage one another. There needs to be a bond. Let me tell you something. You know, I have a lot of things with the, with the old, uh, whatever, Crossroads group and that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the things, one of their strengths was a tremendous sense of belonging. And I think that was part of the draw. I think there are cultic aspects to it. But part of it was this sense of belonging and this tremendous sense of fellowship that draws people. It's not pretend, it's not bop in, shoot out the back door, have nothing to do with anybody. There is a sense of family, you see, and that has to, that then, that's like, you know, the body, those are the things then that allow f sustenance to flow through the body from those connections so we can actually help one another spiritually. If we're just isolated people, you know, like little grains that simply are here and not connected organically, 
Well, then we have difficulty helping one another. And I just want to say that this is an important thing. This is not some, you know, oh, well, yeah, you know, coming to church, leaving it. It's serious because the body of Christ is how God has designed this. It is something that is here to bless us and something that we are to bless. Okay, thanks for coming.